everything we did last week involved going from simplicial complexes to chain complexes to homology groups. Uh, this was the pipeline. So we start with the simplicial complex, K. We build using orientations and then algebraic face maps. We build a chain complex, which we called C K boundary K. And then finally, using kernel modulo image, we would get the homology groups. H of K. And so there was a complicated way of getting from simplicial complexes to chain complexes, another complicated way of getting from chain complexes to homology, but we managed to do all of this and associate to each simplicial complex a sequence of homology groups. This week, our focus is on taking this entire pipeline um, and making it compatible with functions. Now, I've written two copies of exactly the same thing, but of course, um, you could have a simplicial complex L, its chain complex, and then its homology groups. Same pipeline, we just do the same thing twice. Um, and now, let's say you have a simplicial map, which I'll call F, going from K to L. And the question is, what happens on the other two legs of this pipeline? So the first question is, what goes here? Is there any way, reasonable way, using the data of F to relate the two chain, uh, chain complexes? And the second question is, uh, let's say you manage to successfully answer question one, is there any way to introduce uh, or, or create maps between the associated homology groups? That's going to be the focus of the next two lectures. Figuring out what those two vertical blue arrows are is going to take uh, much of the rest of our time. Okay, so here is uh, the answer to the first blue arrow, the, the chain complex stuff. So here's the definition. Uh, if you let F from K to L be a chain complex, sorry, not a chain complex, a simplicial map, Define for each dimension k bigger than or equal to zero the linear map. Remember, we're trying to relate the chain complex of k to the chain complex of L. Um, therefore, we want a linear map, ideally taking the k chains to the k chains. So I'll call it CKF, which goes from the k chains of k to the k chains of L by the following action. So uh, the k chains of k are a vector space. Fortunately, we have access to a basis of that vector space, which is all the k-dimensional simplices. So if I have a linear map, it's enough to describe it on all the basis elements. So on each k simplex, uh, sigma of k. So this linear map is going to take sigma and it's going to spit out something that had better be a k-dimensional chain of the simplicial complex L. And this is going to turn out to be the most natural thing you would want. Um, this is the simplex f of sigma if dimension of f of sigma is the same as the dimension of sigma, which in this case we assumed is k, and it's going to be zero otherwise. Now, here's the thing to check. This map is faithfully taking k-dimensional chains to k-dimensional chains whenever dimension of f of sigma is k. So it sends a k-simplex to a k-simplex. And the, the thing here, the reason we have to send uh, some of these simplices to zero while we preserve the others is because uh, if dimension of f of sigma is not equal to k, then f of sigma is a simplex of dimension strictly lower than k. What this really means is that um, F is not injective on the vertices of sigma. Two of them or more got sent to the same vertex in L, which means you know you squished some dimension and you lost uh, a dimension while going from K to L uh, using the map F. And so those simplices where you lost a dimension don't form basis elements of the K chains in L. They form basis elements of some smaller part, some smaller uh, uh, you know C K minus one or K minus two. And so we ignore those. Um, and so this is called uh, CKF. This is a map that allows us um, 
to go from takes k chains of k to k chains of l. And uh, I'm going to remark again that this highlighted condition, dimension f of sigma equals k, is precisely the same as requiring f to be injective on all the vertices of sigma. Okay, so using a fairly simple recipe, I mean, this is the easiest way you could have used f to take chains in k and produce chains in l. You just apply f to the simplices and add things up. Great. Um, so, okay. Now the question is, great, you've taken chains to chains. What does this have to do with the structure of a chain complex? How does this map interact with the boundary operators? And the easiest way to sort of even conjecture what it might do, uh, you know, short of brute force calculation, is to sit down and just plot what all the vector spaces are. So here you have... Uh, Let's write it in the form of a proposition. For each dimension k greater than or equal to zero. Um, okay, so let's draw pictures of vector spaces. Uh, you have the k chains in k, which our map that we've just built is sending to the k chains of L. You have the same story happening in k minus one chains land. Degree k minus one, it sends the k minus one chains of k to the k minus one chains of L using the same exact formula. Okay, and here on the left, you have the boundary operator of the chain complex k. And I guess this is in degree little k. Okay, and on the right, you have the boundary operator of the chain complex L. And for every possible dimension k bigger than zero, this diagram commutes. Um, and if you don't know what this diagram commutes means, um, all this is saying is that all paths from the k chains of k to the k minus 1 chains of L, there are two of them. There's one that goes up to the right and then down, and then there's one that goes down and then to the right. These two paths are going to give us the exact same uh, linear map from the k chains of k to the k minus 1 chains of L. That's all this is doing. And if this way of phrasing things bothers you, and that's fine if it bothers you the first time you see it, uh, we can write it down uh, in nice and, uh, and algebraic fashion. So here it is. Um, C k minus one f composed with the boundary operator of k is the boundary operator of L composed with C k of f. So, this is the algebraic way of saying what the uh, diagram on the left was uh, was also saying. Um, okay, so let's try and prove this. There are two cases. I'll work one out and sort of not work out the other. It's in the lecture notes if you really care to see it. Um, because the map CKF is defined in such a piecewise fashion, it takes two completely different branches depending on whether dimension of F sigma equals K or not, this proof has to be done um, uh, in two cases. So uh, the, the point is that it is enough to verify the identity, and by identity I mean this red box, um, on all k simplices sigma of k, because again, they form a basis. And if two uh, linear maps agree on every basis element, then they must, have, they, they must be the same map. So let's start with, um, there are two cases. So case one is uh, dimension of f of sigma is the same. So sigma f is injective on the vertices of sigma. And I'll work this case out and show you how it goes. It's a nice and fairly natural um, proof. And we'll, we'll leave the other case as uh, reading material, or, or maybe um, I would actually recommend that you try to work it out on your own without looking at anything and see how far you get. OK, so here is the uh, dimension f sigma equals k case. Um, 
you take one side, let's say the side that was presented to us. So this, well, there isn't that much you can do, right? The first thing you have to do is take the boundary of this simplex sigma. So this is ck minus 1f of this expression for the boundary, which is i going from 0 to k minus 1 to the i, and then the, the algebraic, uh, the, the face with the uh, ith vertex removed. Uh, assuming some orientation, which I'm not bothering to make explicit. And this is by definition of the boundary operator. Okay, now, great, you have this linear map and uh, C k minus 1 f, and it is being evaluated on this sum of k minus 1 dimensional simplices. So, of course, we will exploit linearity. So, this is the same as pulling the sum out minus 1 to the i, if that's just a coefficient, I can take it out, and then ck minus 1 f of this simplex sigma minus i, and this is by linearity of ck minus 1 f. Okay, we're not quite done, but we're really, really close. Uh, the thing to notice is that if dimension of f of sigma equals k, that means there are no two vertices of sigma sent to the same vertex uh, in L, which means that F must also be injected on the vertices of sigma minus i, which means it doesn't send any of them to zero, right? So this is going to be the sum i equals zero to k minus one to the i of F of sigma minus i. Good. And now, um, assuming you've oriented L uh, in a way that is compatible with the orientation on k, which is to say, that f um, uh, respects the orientations. If one vertex is smaller than the other, then the f image of it will be smaller than the other. This is just the same as taking f of sigma and then removing the ith vertex. Um, so this part is by definition of f. And the second thing is uh, by orientation compatibility. Okay, good. Um, and finally, the last bit is to realize that we've got nothing on our hands except the boundary in L off the simplex F sigma. This is by definition of the boundary operator of L. Um, okay, well, this isn't quite what we promised to prove, but you realize um, that this is going to be the same as ckf of sigma. Again, this is by definition, because ckf is the same as f on sigma, where the dimension is preserved. OK, and this is what we had set out to prove. Um, we, we started with, it's been a while, but we started with ck minus 1f composed with uh, the boundary of sigma. Uh, and then we ended with things having flipped. Now you have the boundary of L and CKF on the other side. So um, as expected, uh, this thing commutes. Now, uh, what we've arrived at is, uh, well, not the end of the proof. Now there's case two, which I said I wouldn't do here, which is if dimension of F of sigma is less than k. Um, and in this case, just to give you a hint, both sides will be 0. So it won't be some interesting boundary thing. It will just be uh, both sides are 0. So that case, is, uh, at least the calculation is uh, maybe involved, but, but the answer is fairly trivial. OK, so if you put all of this together, we have um, a sequence of maps that take k chains to k chains and that commute with the boundary operators. So this leads to a definition. So you let c and c prime be any pair of chain complexes. 
over some field f, which we're not writing down explicitly. And now the point is that these simplicial complex, these chain complexes need not have come from any simplicial complex the way, uh, you know, there's no k or l. Uh, a chain map, so this is going to be the notion of a function that takes one chain complex to another, uh, which we'll call phi from uh, c to c prime is a collection of linear maps. So they're going to be uh, one in each dimension. So they send the chains to the chains. This is what our um, uh, CKF was doing. Um, satisfying uh, the same relation that we have uh, above, which is to say phi k minus 1 dk equals d prime k composed with phi k for every k bigger than or equal to 0. And um, an equivalent way of saying this, which I find much easier to remember, your mileage may vary, is that you have this chain complex CK hovering upstairs, going on and on and on, and you have this same thing with C prime uh, hovering downstairs, going on and on and on. Uh, and here you have the boundary maps of k. Here you have the boundary maps of, uh, sorry, upstairs boundary maps of c and downstairs boundary maps of c prime. Um, and what these fees do is that they sandwich themselves in the middle here. So there's phi k plus 1, there's phi k, there's phi k minus 1 and so on, and they sandwich themselves so that um, uh, this entire ladder commutes. So any path from CK plus 1 to CK prime minus 1, um, so, so the two paths, for example, here and here will commute. In fact, in this case, they'll both give 0 because they require you to go through the boundary maps twice. Um, but more interestingly, each square, and this is non-trivial because that won't be 0, those two paths from CK plus 1 to CK prime give you the same linear map. Similarly, if you did this in any other square, you would get the same uh, linear map. So this is the definition of a chain map. And this is um, what goes in to the first arrow with a question mark that we had way at the beginning of the lecture. So this answer is chain map. And um, as a result of this proposition, where we, uh, where we saw uh, what happens when you relate CKF to uh, the boundary operators, um, for every simplicial map, F from K to L, the sequence of linear maps ckf going from the k chains of the simplicial complex k to the k chains of the simplicial complex l constitute a chain map okay so that's the end what we have here is a calculation that shows that we have the ability to go from a map of simplicial complexes to what is a reasonable notion of map between their associated chain complexes. And in the next lecture, we will see what these maps of chain complexes do uh, in terms of uh, the homology groups. See you then.